Hello, everybody. Welcome to the Cabaret Secrets podcast. My name is Gary Williams, and today we're going to talk about music and get some tips on how to work with musicians, particularly those on cruise ships. And I'm joined by one of my favourite musical directors, Joey Mix, who's sitting with me now. Welcome to the Cabaret Secrets, Joey. Thank you very much, Gary. Thanks for having me. Tell me, uh, or anybody who's listening who's not familiar with uh, the whole setup of bands and musical directors, what is it exactly that a musical director does? Well, generally speaking, on most uh, most cruise ships, the musical director will be in charge of running the house orchestra, which would be uh, who any prospective entertainers would be performing with. And they also do various scheduling for the different musicians on board and administration, paperwork, things like that. How long have you been doing this for? Uh, about five years on and off, yeah. So you must have seen a lot of acts in that time. I have seen the, the, the good, the bad, and the ugly, I think. <laughs> <laughs> it's been my impression over the years that the standard has in general got better over the years. I remember, you know, years ago I'd often see really poor acts that didn't really have much of a clue, but it seems to me these... I mean, I don't see many bad acts these days, but you see a lot more than me. What, what's your impression of that? Well, uh, these days I think with the the fall of the economy and everything as it is, uh, many people... Uh, there's just not as much work on land, it seems. So a lot of people who previously would be working in, in shows or doing touring shows or things like that are actually starting to come to cruise ships more often because that's where the work is. Yeah. <laughs> but do you think the standard is better because of that or worse or pretty much the, the same? I'd, I'd say it's gotten better, yeah. I've, I've, uh, when I first started, my first ship ever was on, on Carnival uh, in 2001, so it's been nearly 11 years ago now. <laughs> and, uh, and back then, yeah, there was, there was definitely worse acts than there is now people's perception of, of, of what they need to be doing has gotten better as well. So uh, you end up getting better crafted shows, it seems. It's interesting because I don't know what it's like in the States, but in the UK, when I started, I came up through the working men's clubs, like social clubs, uh, where there'd usually be an organ and drums or just a little yeah. trio or something, and, and an audience, you know, and do your show. That kind of scene is certainly not as big as it was. And I don't know where people are learning their trade, learning their craft now. So it's encouraging. If you say that people are coming on and they seem to know what they're doing, the new acts, if you see new acts and they seem to know what they're doing, I wonder where they're learning their craft. Uh, I'd say probably YouTube. <laughs> really? Seriously? <laughs> I think a lot of people, they, they do research and they watch other people's shows and try to try to find something I won't want to say stealing, but it'd be inspired. <laughs> yes, they'll be influenced by someone <laughs> and, and, and try to uh, and try to take something from from other people's shows and, and blend it in with their own ideas and come up with their own their own. Do shows. you find a lot of the shows, a lot of acts, are very samey? That it's all a pretty sort of middle of the road safe thing, or do you do you still get surprised? We still get surprised from time to time, but that's that's uh, actually one of the one of the complaints that, that we have as as cruise ship musicians is. Uh, a lot of people, it seems that it's the same set of maybe 100 or 200 songs that everybody chooses from to do their show. Yeah. When there's literally thousands and thousands and thousands of songs out there you could be choosing from. So why do you think that is? I think they're going for the middle of the road, as you say. It's, uh, you, you have to uh, do things that you're hoping the audience knows and likes, so you're going to pick the most popular things that you can do, I would imagine. Yeah, yeah it's, for me, I, I, it's interesting because for, for a long time I realised that almost whenever I'd work on land, it was very rare that any of those songs I would perform on ships. You know, the stuff, I would have my land shows and my ship shows, and the stuff that I would like to perform on ships, but I feel that when I'm on a ship, you know, on land, when they come and see me, it's because they know who I am, they know what I'm going to do, and, uh, you know, and I can be a little bit more indulgent or, you know, p a cater to that very specific audience. But on a ship, you don't know who you're going to get. You've got such a wide uh, range of people of all different ages from different countries. And I feel the pressure to to keep it very safe and, you know, everyone's a winner. I, I personally don't feel that I've got the, the liberty to stick in a few surprises, or I wish I could, you know, I'd like to do that, <laughs> but I worry that if I do that too often that, you know, I'll alienate too many of the people too much of the time and the ratings will be bad and I won't get booked again. Yeah, it's a very good way to think about it from, from your perspective. Uh... I suppose you can get away with with throwing a throwing a curveball in there every now and again, um, but yeah, you, you really you really have to. It's a multicultural audience, so you have to do things that that hopefully people know. You know, it's the songs that have had international success, and 
I, it's, I, it's interesting for when people are putting their acts, the people listening to this now and are looking at putting their acts together, putting a new show together. And I always say to people, you know, don't forget your audience and don't be self indulgent. Don't start doing, you know, off off Broadway stuff, you know, by a wonderful writer, you know, that no one's ever heard of. Because it may be an exquisite song and beautiful. It may be something that the band just love to play because it's got great chords in it. It's a really clever, well crafted tune. But if the audience don't like it, I tend to say to people, forget it, just go with something, you know, there's lots of tunes out there, go find tunes which are well done, which are well crafted, which people, you know, which is a majority of the audience are also going to like, but I mean, do, do you actually think that's wrong? Do you think there is room to stick in one or two little surprises? Yeah, I think it's okay, um, especially if you're, the rest of your show is things that are going to be easily recognisable, you could probably stick in maybe one song in the middle or something like that, that, uh, that people wouldn't know maybe something that's a newer song from a newer show or something mm. like that there's nothing wrong with trying to educate them a little bit yeah. <laughs> <laughs> educate and entertain that's eh? right. so yeah. tell me when a, 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 a new act comes onto a ship what is it and, and they come to a rehearsal how should they conduct themselves in a way that's going to make you guys happy and get the band on side <laughs> Uh, how's the battery on this thing? Uh, how much time do we have? <laughs> um, first off, uh, your, your music is, is an important thing for us because that's going to your, your charts and, and what you present to the to the band is going to be their initial impression of, of of you. So if you have things that are well arranged and clean and, and professionally written, um, a lot of I know I know it's a costly thing to get to get good good arrangements made for you. But uh, it's definitely going to work, pay off for you in the long run. Uh, things that are written poorly are going to sound like they were written poorly, and it's just, it's it's going to make the band uh, angry. It's going to make them frustrated, and uh, they might not necessarily say anything to you, but they're going to be feeling it, and they're not going to feel as good about performing your show. You know, so if you, you your music needs to be very clean and professionally done. Uh, what should someone expect to pay for a, for a, an arrangement, a chart? Um, anywhere, I mean, I know, I know of some, uh, some companies who basically they just have all their, all their arrangements on a store digitally and they're not writing anything for anyone. They're just printing it off and giving it to them. Uh, I think you can get things there for like $50, something like that. So cheap. Yeah. And is that stuff well written? Is it good? Not really. <laughs> ah, okay. So to get something written especially for themselves, if I've got some ideas, I want it in a particular key or I want to make a medley or, I mean, I know it's, you can spend, you know, it's a, a, a broad range of, of what you can spend. But let's say a standard tune, you know, like, um, I don't know, My Heart Will Go On or something, you know, <laughs> a classic like that. Or, you know, for me, New York, New York or something like that. Does a standard, you know, three-minute tune uh, arrange for a, a band on a ship, what, what would I expect to be uh, paying? I'd say somewhere between three, four hundred dollars for uh, for something that's really well done, written for for our size band, which is a nine nine piece band. Yeah. And would I get uh, that generally? I mean, do you like to see stuff these days uh, written by hand or or on a computer, or does it make any difference? Um, it does make a difference. So uh, I'd say for the most part, uh, I, I would go for the computer printed. Uh, the it seems that the the old tradition of people writing manuscript is gone, and it's and it's not happening really anymore. People used to make a living off of off of copying, mm. off of copy work, and that doesn't. Right. You pay the arranger, and he would and arranger write a score, yeah. and then it would be given to the copyist, and he would write out all the parts by hand, and <laughs> won't be tired if you lost one, right? <laughs> yeah. or, or if you emptied your spit valve on, uh, <laughs> on a nice, freshly written inky chart. Yeah. yeah. No, well, nowadays you, you'll you'll get uh, you'll get. You get all your music digitally and, and print them off yourself, or have them print and taped by the by the arranger, and, and you'd still get them digitally. So if you did lose something, that wouldn't be a problem. It's very handy these days. I, I carry everything on the computer. I've got everything's as PDFs, and if I lose a chart, particularly it's useful for me because if I come on a ship, and I might bring one and a half shows worth, and I might get there, and they say, "Oh, can you do two shows?" Or we need you to do another 15 minutes, or something's gone wrong. We need you to do two full shows, or somebody will make a request. I don't have to panic or worry, and I don't have to carry, you know, 60 arrangements with me i've just got it all on a disc and i can print it out as and when i need it so when a, an act comes on so he's got his charts yeah. well written charts which are going to you know be put in front of the band and hopefully going to impress the band what you know what, is it up to the the vocalist to run the rehearsal conduct the rehearsal in some way i mean how should for someone that's never done it before it, it, it i mean it's a long time ago when i did it for the first time but i can still remember it being quite intimidating and daunting you know you come on particularly for me because i'm not a musician i don't read uh, music i don't understand music i understand a little bit more now but i certainly didn't really understand anything and you sort of got these professionals these you know 
hard-nosed <laughs> geezers sitting there, you know, thinking, who have we got today then, you know. Um, it's intimidating. So, you know, give us some advice for anybody listening on how they should handle themselves the first time they step in front of a, of a band. So it's your, your first rehearsal, yes. So you uh, show up early. If you're, if you're showing up on time, you're, you're pretty much late because everybody else should be there ahead of time and, and be ready to go. Um, once, you, once you get your sound sorted out and everything, which, once again, is something um, you could do previous to the band, band's arrival if you uh, have specific sound problems or specific uh, effects or something that you're doing in the show, that's something that you can arrange time with with the sound technician. So right. arrange for the sound guy to be there early as well, yeah, yeah. and maybe even the lighting people, and yeah. figure out any little important things which are going to hold up the rehearsal. So get that done beforehand yeah. so the rehearsal with the band you can just focus on rehearsing with the band rehearsing, yeah rehearsing the music uh, if, you're, if you're not a musician if you're a singer that doesn't read music um, most of the time the, the musical director will be comfortable with, with leading the rehearsal and, and giving you suggestions on tempos and different, uh, different if there's rubato sections where you need the pianist to follow you or something like that then uh, any, any competent musical director would be able to, uh, would be able to run the rehearsal efficiently and, and you shouldn't have to really stress yourself about it. That being said, as you begin to know your show more, you're obviously going to start finding problematic spots that the bands frequently have problems with. So it would be a good thing for you to take notes of those, those problematic things. And then when you're rehearsing the next band, you can say, well, I always have a problem at letter G in this chart, so why don't we look at that first? Mm. And, and things like that, uh, for me anyway, when the, when the act really knows his music well and, and his or her music well, mm. uh, it, it really makes an impression on us, well, this guy knows what he's doing because he obviously knows all of his music and... So if, in my case, as in my case, I don't, I don't read music, you know, when I first started, I used to sort of sometimes try and pretend that I, or I'd sort of keep quiet, but just sort of leave the assumption <laughs> that I could, you know, and I might say, try and say one or two musicy sounding words, you know, to sort of make it sound, but then I thought, I'm, I'm on thin ice here. I mean, do you think it's better if they just come clean and just say, look, guys, you know, I don't, I don't read music, but, you know, see if you can help me through this, or do you think that you just, just shut up, or that's going to, I mean, do, do you really care? Does it make any difference to you whether the singer can read music or not? It doesn't make any difference to us, really, if the singer can read. It, it makes a difference if they can sing. So, if, we, <laughs> <laughs> so if, it, if it winds up, you have a terrific singer who comes in and hands you the music and says, look, I need you to run the rehearsal. I don't read music. I'm, I'm not a conductor or anything like that. That's, that's perfectly fine. Mm. Uh, I don't have any sort of problem with that. Yeah. And I, I assume that when they're going through the rehearsal with the band, again, if they've got anecdotes or bits of chat that they're going to do during the show, you don't want to sit there and listen to, listen to them rehearsing that, right? No, and except for particular cues, which might be for me to count in something. Uh, that, that's, that's fine, but no, we don't want to hear all the talking. We'll hear it at the show. <laughs> yeah, exactly. When I rehearse now with the band, as you know, I like to... The, I know with my anecdotes and my chat, there'll be a cue line, a cue sentence that leads into the next song when I'm going to want you to count the band off. So in when we rehearse, I'll always make sure I give that last cue line, that last sentence. And each, if we need to rehearse the song again... I'll give that line again because I like to try and just keep, you know, reminding the musical director that that's 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 their cue because it's important. It definitely puts it in your head when you've heard you've heard the joke before, the line that's going to be said. Once you got that in your head, it's when you hear it at the show. There's no question about it. It's like, well, I know I need to start now. You know? Because there's, a, I always I'm aware that there is. A, I mean, I know it's what you do, and that you're a professional at what you do. But there's a tremendous amount for you, particularly as a musical director, to take in in a short time. I mean, not only are you reading all the music often for the first time, straight off them playing it and making it sound as good as it can be, but you're having to be aware of tempos and, like you said, the rubatos and where things slow down or speed up or you know when to bring things off all the little things that need to be done to make the arrangement work and listening to and being aware of when the singer's going to make a cue that you've got to respond to yes it's a it's it's a lot of information to take in i've been i've been doing this for quite a while so it's uh a lot of the music i'm very familiar with so that that helps as well i thought one of the biggest problems i have is if there's songs that are segued one to the next is finding spots to set my metronome in between, in between <laughs> during the song you know? so I'll either find a spot when I'm resting, luckily I'm, I'm a horn player so I get spots where I'm resting but uh, that finding spots to reset the metronome and, and in medleys you're thinking about the next tempo and you're always thinking about what's, what's going to happen next it seems that uh, for some reason this very small brain of mine deals with it very well though <laughs> <laughs> Have you noticed a tendency uh, for singers um, 
taking on more of that directing role themselves these days. I've heard other musical directors say to me that singers these days, they often come on and it kind of frustrates them because, you know, the MD's there ready to count the things off and ready to sort of direct the band and they're finding that more singers and musical, uh, musical acts, you know, mm. um, instrumentalists are doing more of that themselves. Have you noticed that and does, do you have an opinion on that? I, I've definitely noticed that and some of the, some of the acts we have here do that. Um, it, I, I guess it shouldn't bother me because if they want that they want to count in their own stuff and they want to direct the band and it's their show, then they should do it. But at, at the end of the day, the, the band plays with me seven days a week and they know how to follow me. They watch me conduct. They know what my cutoffs are. So there's no questions. I think it's just easier if, if the band follows me because they're used to it. You know? Sometimes I will sort of be waving my arms around, sort of conducting the band at the end, you know, towards the end of a tune, and I'm doing it really for the audience's benefit, for sort of showbiz, you know, I'm sort of, because it, sort of, it looks sort of strong and... Like, but I, 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 well, I'll usually say to the band, watch the MD, the MD watches me, right, <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, and so what I'm doing is for sort of the audience's benefit, for showbiz, for theatricality, but musically I still want it to, to, to know that it's going to be right, so for God's sake, don't follow the singer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and, and in your show, you give pretty clear cutoffs at the end, so I just try to follow you, I watch your, I watch your hand or whatever you're doing. And, uh... and do you find then that the band are really watching you? Yeah. I think they're watching me. <laughs> That's why it keeps working. <laughs> they're watching you. So uh, give, give us some more uh, you know, tips on when singers are working with the bands and sort of some do's and don'ts and things which they might do which drive you crazy. Well, um, some, some things, uh, one, one in particular, when you're, depending on the band, for me anyway, my, my, my guys are a good group. Um, I, I don't mind when... Uh, when the entertainers talk directly to the various members of the band, but if there starts to be any any sort of problems, any issues, the the thing to do is to go straight to the musical director and and start giving all of your uh, all of your your rapport back and forth uh, to try to move the rehearsal along. Just give it all to the musical director, and he can then can then give orders to the band. Um, Let's think about things that... Uh, I mean, that point that you just said, quite interesting, because, <laughs> yeah, yeah why, are you, why are you going to seek revenge on singers? Um, you, you know, that's, that's a good point, and I probably uh, need to watch that myself, because if I'm doing a rehearsal, and, and, and I know that the pianist has just messed something up, or there's, you know, something that's like a common uh, problem, or one of the musicians, I will often just say to that musician, oh, but, but, but I'll tell them what that is. Really, would you prefer it if I went to you always as the MD and for you to dissipate that information? Not, not with this group of group of musicians here. It's, it's, uh, it's, it's. We've all been working together for quite a while, and it's, uh, it's pretty good team. Uh, on cruise ships, you're going to find a lot of the times the musicians don't know each other very well, and they're, they've just begun working with each other. So there could be some personality conflicts w within the group, which could cause problems. But, uh, but in this group, I, I, I have no problem like that. So. Uh, when, when various entertainers come on, on board here, I, I, I don't mind them speaking directly. How do you find, honestly, the, the standard of musicianship on board ships compared to uh, land? Um, it, it honestly depends on the company. Uh, I'm really impressed with the, the line I'm working for now. Uh, the general in-house musicians are far better than some other ships I've worked for, some other companies I've worked for. Um, I, I've seen really, really bad on, on some ships where they... For instance, where the the office who is doing the hiring don't do any auditions and they just take people by word of mouth. And I've been on those ships. Yeah, me too. <laughs> and you end up with like a trumpet player who, who's supposed to be playing your first part and he can't even reach any of the high notes. Mm -hmm. And you're a drummer who can't read music and things like that. On on this line in particular, it's very good. Um, but I have seen musicians who are making a paycheck on land who would never. I mean, on ships who would never be doing that at home. Mm. It depends on the. Uh, I, I guess, think it's rare though. Uh, it, it's it's hopefully it's becoming more rare. <laughs> I mean, there are certain lines that I work for where the musicianship is not as strong as it is here. Obviously, there are going to be sounds, but I find I don't really mind if I mean with anybody that I'm working with, whatever it is they do, if it's a sound guy or a light guy or whoever, it, it, I don't care if they're they're not technically great as long as they're really trying and on some places Very i go important. you know that they'll 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 want the, if, if they say to me can we have the music a day or two early my first thought is always oh there we go you know <laughs> but actually then I, I know that it's good that they're asking for it early because i know they're going to look at it and i'll do a rehearsal with these guys and it'll take a long time but i'll be very patient and then and there'll be something that we're struggling with but i know that we'll sort of leave it they'll say look leave this let's move on we'll look at it ourselves 
and then we'll go back and have another sort of half an hour before the show, and they all have spent all afternoon, you know, yeah, yeah. working on it. And I find some musicians, everyone's got their strengths. Some people are great readers, some are great improvisers. Some people, yeah. once they know the tune, they might not be great readers, but once they know it, they can really feel it well. Yeah. Right? So everyone's yeah. got their strengths and weaknesses. That's very true, yeah. Um, I guess that's any profession. You want people to be doing their best. So if they're trying hard, that's, that's what you want. And uh, the, uh, the general level, if... if I think I know what kind of band you're talking about. A lot of these guys play tremendously by ear, and once they've heard something, they can play it perfectly back to you. But the reading's not so good. So I think you're doing the right thing by giving music ahead of time, and I, I suppose it might be a drag that your rehearsal has to be longer, but, you know, if you want to have a good product at the end. And the result is sometimes better, you know, because yeah, they're really yeah. into it, and they look, yeah. it takes a long time, and particularly when I've been back on these ships, and the, the, the same guys are there, and, I've, you know, they, they know my show already. They really, really get into it, and I love... You know, I'd rather work with a band that might not be the best musicians in the world, but I want to I feel a good energy coming off the stage, and I want to look behind me and see people smiling and enjoying themselves. And that means a lot, and it's sometimes hard to find when, you know, guys have been doing on an eight-month contract or whatever as it is in some places, right? Yeah, you, you, you uh, definitely get uh, the fair share of people getting bad attitudes in, on, on ship bands, I'm sure of that. I've, I've experienced it here and, and on other ships, but it's, it's unfortunate because at the end of the day, we are getting paid to play play music and to play good shows with, with good entertainers. But I think that's why it's so important, like you said about the sheet music. I mean, that's our calling card as, 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 as really singers, is. right? Yeah. That's the, the first impression before we've even said anything. Put the music on the sound. I, I, I can't stress to people, just like you, I can't stress enough of how important it is to spend money, invest, because I think it's like a new business, you know, and if you were starting a new business, a new franchise, you'd expect to spend thousands and thousands yeah. on yeah. this thing, you know, and the charts that I use now, I've had some of them for nearly 20 years, you know, so it's the, they've, they've had a return on their investment. You know, <laughs> it's worth spending money because what I, you know, what what I need to do is get the band on side. I want them to be in a good mood. I want yeah. them to be happy. I want them to think, oh, he's coming back. Oh, that's good. We'll quite enjoy that show. Not, yeah. you know, not oh God, not not all that again. You know, don't tell me what you are actually thinking. <laughs> <laughs> no, it's uh, you're absolutely right. When we, when as soon as we look at the music, we've all been reading music our whole lives, and we we open these charts up and we. Most of the nine times out of ten, we're going to know who the arranger is because we would have played something by him before. Mm -hmm. And so straight off, we're going to say, oh, it's this guy. All right, it's going to be okay then, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. And then adversely sometimes, I, I don't want to mention any names, but we do, uh, sometimes you look at the who's been the, the arranger and think, oh, God, this again, you know. Mm -hmm. But um, either way, sometimes you can make, make charts that aren't, aren't the best sound good as long as you play them uh, the way they're, they're written rather than the way that you you know the original of the song you know you, sometimes there's mistakes written in, in music but it kind of works so we, we play it that way <laughs> what happens if you're playing a chart and you find you know something that's wrong just plain wrong in the chart um i mean do you do you try and fix it or do you just sort of you know just ignore it or what do you do um depending on the spot obviously and then how important where the mistake is we'll uh if it's an important thing we'll definitely correct the mistake and make and, and let the let the act aware of it you know there's a mistake in your part here and i've penciled it in i've corrected it mm. yeah we definitely have to correct something tell me um something i've often wondered i can be using a chart for years i mean literally years and it always works well it works fine and then suddenly somewhere a musician will say oh hang on there's a there's something here. and they'll, they'll have a little conversation amongst themselves about changing a chord changing some notes and they'll tell me oh this doesn't work it's not written properly and i think to myself okay but it's worked for the last six years you know what is it they're obviously not making it up you must find that happens from time to time what's going on um it's kind of a, a thing when you're when you're a professional musician uh, one of one of your goals in rehearsal is not to really cause any waves you don't want to stop rehearsal time so if it's an obvious glaring mistake you're probably just going to play what you know is correct and uh, and not even mention it. I've, I've done that before. I found myself guilty of that. It's probably not the right thing to do. You should probably pencil it in the part so the next guy knows that, that there's a mistake here. But, um, yeah, it does happen, though. I think from a singer's, from my point of view, I think the best thing, I mean, either stop the rehearsal and fix it, but obviously, you know, if, if it's a minor thing, we want to get on the rehearsal. But maybe to mention it to the singer yeah. 
after the rehearsal because you know what I've learned this now but if I'd had a child that had worked for years and someone would start making a fuss about something I'd think they were just being difficult or I'd think they were being wrong so I'd have a bit of an attitude with them you know I'd say come on you know what's what's wrong I, I, no one else has had a problem with it I've subsequently realized just as you've said that actually no one people have had a problem with it but they've had the courtesy not to say anything about it and just keep their head down correct it make it work and not even tell me and I'm standing there thinking my parts are perfect <laughs> when in fact they're flawed you know but no one said anything and and uh, it, it but it's good to know because we need to know so that we can fix it and and make it uh, right for the next group of musicians yeah, right yeah that's correct yeah I guess yeah I, I found myself guilty of that as well just think if, if it's a simple note mistake or something like that I, I'll breeze through that with no problem and maybe even forget to mention it yeah, I think most people are the same yeah, yeah. so tell me then what drives you crazy I mean there must be some things that guest entertainers come on and do and you think ay, ay, ay. oh absolutely uh, <laughs> share them get it off your chest <laughs> well like I said uh, earlier showing up on time is very important because we when the when the rehearsal starts at four we want to be moving along with the rehearsal at four we don't want to be waiting for somebody to get their mic set up or anything like that um that's that's the number one thing uh um having your having your show order all together and it's very handy if everyone in the band gets a copy of the what the the order of the show and all your music is already in order with folders and everything so it's just uh bing bang bong we're done got the music passed out everything's in order that way you don't have to worry about guys shuffling music around and everything that, like that. Um, let's see. Things that bother me. <laughs> a lot of times we, we spend a lot of wasted time on stage, it seems, where, where we're just sitting around and either the entertainer or our, our, our in-house entertainment here uh, are doing... You mean the technical team? No, the, well, the technical team or the, the singers. And oh, right, the production singers. Yeah. yeah. And we'll they'll be solving their own problems and the whole band's just sitting here and we always wonder why why are we here right now it's like yeah. they, they couldn't figure out a, a time to sort this out until all of us were here you know? yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> i think what, what we really want to happen is just to, to get to get everything accomplished in a short amount of time and and uh not to waste time Mm. That's what really frustrates me on the on the bandstand. I'd like to. <laughs> what do you feel about uh, click tracks uh, when entertainers come on and use click tracks? And, and just explain quickly what a click track is for anybody that doesn't know. It's basically uh, the click track is basically a, a metronome that's gonna that's gonna click in the musician's ears through a headphone system, and uh, it, it'll guide you through all, any tempo changes and give you count ends and things like that. And you could also have backing tracks that provide more instruments that the band don't have, or maybe background vocals. You so the band sort of playing along to sort of a backing track really and then you've got in your yeah. in your ear click 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 to make sure you stay playing in tempo with the backing yeah. track yeah. so how do you feel about i mean is that do you like click tracks or, or not i've found them useful in some situations overall I, I i prefer to be playing live music all the time but um in some situations uh for instance if you had a a, a long medley with with you know, 20 different tempo changes or something like that you're going to save yourself a lot of rehearsal time by having that on a click track mm. um I've I've seen it work for kind of obscure songs like something like Bohemian Rhapsody or something like that. It's got a lot of different different things going on and a lot of instruments that we don't have on the stage. I've, the people sort of expect to hear. Exactly, people are going to expect to hear all these string sounds and everything. But uh, and they don't know or care where it's coming from. <laughs> they don't know and they certainly don't care. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, I, I think all in all, the click track is a it's not a great thing for for live music because. Uh, Obviously, you could put things on a tape and not hire as many musicians. For the, for the reasons that you said, I, I used to use click tracks for, I don't know, maybe eight or nine tunes, that are songs that I would perform. But, you know, there'd be such a groan would go up with the musicians, you know, when they knew I was using clicks. And they'd be like, why? Why are you using clicks? i say, well, you know, because I've got all this percussion and all these strings and all these extra instruments. It just gives it a more impact and more of a build. But I also, I didn't like using them because technically it would take extra time to set it up and everybody getting comfortable with the levels of the click in their ears. And this, you know, it just seemed to take some of the heart and soul out of the band because you're not, you're, just, you're not going sort of instinctively. You have, you've got this click, 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 click in your ear and it, it, it sort of makes the whole thing literally a bit more mechanical. It certainly does, yeah. It's, um, that's one of the beauties of, of our art is that we can... Uh, 
one time when you play a song, it won't sound like the next time yeah, you play it because yeah. you, you might change something here, change something there with the tempo or something. And when you when you put that, that metronome in your ear, there's going to be no changes. Everything's going to sound the same time after time. But if that's what you want, you know, that's what you get. Sure, sure, sure. <laughs> but, I mean, for me, and I know it depends on the genre, but in the genre that I sing, I don't, I've realized you don't need to have, you know, this full orchestral sound, even if that's the way that the original was. Sometimes it can be very refreshing to hear something done in a smaller way, even on the ships where they've only got a quartet. Um, you know, mm -hmm. people say to me, oh, you're doing Sinatra, you need to have that big band, you know, that brass sound, and you absolutely don't at all. It can sound terrific just with a trio or with a trio and a, and, and a guitar or a, or a saxophone, just if the arrangements are written in, in the proper way. Uh, the, it, it, I, I always think it's, it's better to make the best of the musicians that you've got than sort of try and, uh, you know, make more of it, to try and sort of add this, I don't know, this sort of false layers onto it to sort of pretend, hey, guys, this is a big band, when <coughs> clearly it isn't, you know, it's, 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 a, it's a jazzy quartet, and so let's make the most of having a jazzy quartet. Yeah, that's, that's, that's a good way to look at it. I mean, look at Tony Bennett. He's been touring for years with a trio, and he's, he's working out fine. His promoter must be delighted, right? <laughs> yeah. yeah, I'm sure they're doing well. <laughs> but it's true. I saw him at uh, the Albert Hall a few years ago, and, yeah, I mean, it was amazing. And it, and it was amazing for that reason, that you're looking down at this huge hall, a huge stage, yeah. and he's there with his... Literally, little trio yeah. and Tony Bennett, and the, the sound was amazing. The whole thing was amazing. It, it's a good. Uh, it's a good point, actually. You don't need a huge band. Yeah, um, obviously. Don't put yourself out of a job. <laughs> <laughs> obviously, uh, the more musicians, the higher, the more of us are getting work. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And it is nice. It is very nice to have a, on a ship like this. We've got two trumpets and a trombone and two saxophones and a guitar and piano bass and drums and it is nice for me that when i've got that it, it's great fun to have and it does make it very impactful yeah it's it's a it's a good sized band here i mean i i could do with a, another partner playing trombone with me that'd be fun but uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. but uh we i i could see what you're saying the, the working with what you got because i have seen some click track shows where like you say it's a small band and you're hearing so much uh so much uh, recorded music that you're thinking this I mean you can't even really tell what the band's playing and what they're not you know and uh, it just it becomes a kind of a fake sounding thing you know you don't have a full symphony orchestra so why try to make it sound like that mm -hmm. you know? what about um do acts do many acts try and get the band involved in the show you know uh, some kind of band participation or little jokes or bits of shtick bits of business does that come up very often how do you guys feel about that uh within reason I I'm I'm generally generally easy to easy to work with on things like that um we've had we've had entertainers want people to wear wigs and funny ties and hats and all sorts uh as long as it's not out of control i don't i don't really mind um logistically on this stage it's hard for us because the the way we're set up at the back of the stage it's hard for us to move around but i've had some acts who want to bring all the horn players all down front of the stage and have us play solos and stuff I, I don't mind uh, doing that either, as long as it's music related. Uh, I don't, I don't want to be, be made a clown of or anything mm -hmm. like that. But uh, I'll come out front and play a solo. Yeah, it's, that's great. But uh, if, if you keep if you keep the musicians playing music, that's probably the best thing. <laughs> so you've mentioned one or two things that uh, you know always annoy you if if they happen with music. I mean, what would you say to round off uh, some of the the, the do some of the things that acts should really remember to to try and you know make sure they do to get the best out of the musicians and 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 ultimately have them make make the best show that they can. Well, um, generally being friendly, uh, introduce yourself to everyone, uh, say hi to everyone if it's people you haven't worked with before. Um, you know, I spend, when I go on a ship for the first few days, I spend a lot of time, I get a list of the musicians' names and I try and memorize the names of the band because uh, I think it's just manners, you know, when you're going to be working with these people and you meet them. It takes a long time to remember everybody's name, yeah, particularly yeah. on a ship I've not worked before, but I think it's, it's, it's worth it because it, beca it, it creates, again, it's that first initial impact with the yeah, guys, right? Yeah. That's, I didn't know you did that. That's, that's pretty smart. Well, I did forget your drummer's name today, but yeah, that's, uh, that's, that's for other reasons. I, I carry a piece of paper around with me, and I take it to the gym with me, and I try and, you know, and I do it. It'll take me like two days to remember everybody's names, and, and people think, well, why do you do that? But it, it's because, you know, I know I've got, what, I've got a few seconds to make a first impression with a new group of musicians, and, the, you know, the band is 
were sort of partners. I, you know, we're partners. We're there together on stage to make a yeah, show. Yeah. I think some singers might come on with an attitude of, I'm the star, you know, it's my show, and these are sort of my backup people, you yeah, know, yeah. And, uh, and, you know, they're there to do the job and they'll do what I tell them to do. I don't think like that at all because, you know, we have to be like one cohesive unit, not just musically, but, you know, we have to be... I want, I want the guys to be happy and to, to enjoy... I want to enjoy it and I want them to enjoy it, and I think the audience really sense I, I mean they absolutely sense the, the the vibe with the musicians they sense the energy and they're always looking you know the audience uh, you know i'd like to think that they're looking at me all the time but i know they're not you know they're, their eyes are drifting over the musicians and seeing what they're doing um so it's important for all of those reasons that you know we get everybody on side so i interrupted you you were saying introduce yourself to the to the, to the band and be uh, courteous yeah be courteous and friendly uh, a lot of a lot of times we get uh, entertainers well i won't say a lot of times but there's a there's a few entertainers we get who just seems like they just don't know how to talk to people in general they, they talk down to us as if we're uh, like you said we're, we're their backups or something like that but it, and, and it's not even sometimes it feels like it's in a nasty way uh, and that's that's not that's not pleasant for any of us it just kind of creates a harsh working environment for us um, so, so definitely don't do that just be friendly to everybody and, and, and treat them as your colleagues like you're saying we're, we're all here working together and the us getting along is going to make the rehearsal quicker it's going to make us work well together it's going to make the entire the entire process of us doing the rehearsal and putting the show together better as long if we're getting along and, and it's a friendly manner and maybe a little joke here and there that that kind of stuff's fine and then after the shows take the band out and buy them a drink <laughs> <laughs> and on that final word, that's it. Thank you so much for all that. It's great because these are the questions that I think a lot of people might have, but they were never in a position to really ask the musical director. So thank you for sharing all that with us. And hopefully, because of people listening to this, that when they do come along on a ship for the first time or even off a ship, working with any group of musicians, they're going to be better prepared and make the right impression and everyone's going to have a better experience. Yeah, that, that sounds great. I think it's a really great thing you're doing, putting together all this information because it's... Uh... A lot of people want to know this, and, uh, and, and you're giving it access for free. Thank you for listening to this Cabaret Secrets podcast. If you've got any comments or questions, please visit cabaretsecrets.com, where you'll also find details of the Cabaret Secrets book, an indispensable guide on how to create your own show, travel the world, and get paid to do what you love.